Health Center uh, located in the central region in Alexandria. Uh, <coughs> today I'm going to talk a little bit about soybean disease ID, give some general management considerations, and uh, talk about <coughs> what impact no-till systems may have on, on these diseases. And then Tom's going to talk about fungicide, right? <coughs> you guess. So we're going to talk about disease ID, we're going to talk a little bit about genetic resistance and how it pertains to uh, disease management. And this, this thing, go, this goes for any crop. Uh, the foundation for any kind of disease management program is going to begin with, with disease risk resistant varieties. You're going to build on that and go from there. LSU, Mississippi State. Most, most land-grant universities have a variety testing program. We test varieties at seven different locations in the state. That information is free. I encourage you when you're looking for varieties to, to uh, prove those results and pick varieties that are going to be high yielding and have resistance to particular diseases that you have in your area. Um, so let's start with seedling disease. There we go. Um, seedling disease are caused really by two fungi and two fungal-like organisms, Rhizoctonium fusarium, Pythium, Phytophthora. These, these particular seedling disease, at least in Louisiana, is not much of an issue. Now, I'm sure as, as you go north, where it gets maybe a little bit cooler, you've got wetter soils at times, seedling disease may, may impact stand and possibly yield. So really and truly, when you need to use a, a seed treatment, it's hard you have to plant during kind of inclement weather when, when soils are cool. Okay. They're soil born. They reside in plant debris. The Pythium and the Phytophthora, they like water. So no-till situations is going to harbor those, those organisms. So we need to be aware of that. Any questions about seedling disease? So foliar diseases. Um, in Louisiana, Cercospora leaf fly is probably the number one problem that we have to deal with consistently <coughs> year in and year out. There's also another uh, phase of that that's going to be purple seed stain. Usually it starts with kind of a, a petiole, chocolate colored petiole lesions. You get this kind of a leathery look, bronzing, and then it turns into a, bright, a blight. It develops between about 70, 90 degrees. You need some leaf wetness period anywhere from about 8 to 24 hours. It's going to be stress related. It's on the seed, it's in the plant debris, and it also can be introduced into fields by wind blown spores. The reason it's so hard to control is that the population is, is very genetically diverse. We know that it has three different species that cause this, <coughs> this problem. Um, long time ago, Tom, the strobies were great, but that's not the case anymore. You see this lesion here? This is a field in northeast Louisiana. Uh, several sure. days later, you had heavy foliation due to this particular problem. It's something that we've had to deal with. <coughs> this is the purple stained seed that you would see. <coughs> No-till situation is going to increase the risk of this disease because it overwinters on this infested plant debris. <coughs> Also, you can get infected seedlings. It can cause seedling death. And if it doesn't, those, those plants will have latent infections that could be a problem later in the growing season. We're going to manage it using crop rotation, uh, disease-free seed. We have limited genetic resistance at best. Uh, USB has, has a project we're looking at some plant introductions. There is some promise. And then fungicides. We have resistance to the, th the strobes. This is also with the thiophytic methyl. This would be the topsin M. This is some work that Dr. Price did for his dissertation. <coughs> these, are, these are all confirmed parishes with resistant populations. And that was a while back, so we know it's probably spread. Don't confuse it with other things like chloride injury. You don't want to go out and treat a field and waste your money on a fungicide application on a crop that's, about, <laughs> that's probably going to be dead in the growing season. Certainly reduced yields. <clears throat> Frog eye leaf spot. It's a cousin to uh, Cercospora leaf blight. 
It's caused by Cercospirus sagitta. You get these small pinpoint <coughs> lesions as they mature. They enlarge, you get tan colored centers, you get this black colored whisker like structures, and those are the spores. It's going to develop during warm, wet weather. Um, it, infections can occur throughout the entire growing season. Usually, you don't see these symptoms until later in the growing season. Uh, they usually occur on the stems. Under severe situations, you can see them on the pods and the stems as well. Again, this organism overwinters on infested plant debris. So anytime you leave that in the field, you're going to increase the risk due to that particular disease. And it also has very diverse genetic population. This is a field in central Louisiana, severe defoliation. There's that whisker-like spore structures in the center. Crop rotation, residue management. The good thing is we do have good genetic resistance. Uh, we, we do ratings, Dr. Price and I do ratings at, on the OVTs every year. That information is available in, in our variety publication. This is from his work, again, resistance to strobe. So now we have what? Two diseases with strobe resistance. Our neighbor to the east, <coughs> and I, have you filled those in yet, Tom? <coughs> So we've, been, we've been busy since standards left. No, but I mean, it's probably occurring in those it's counties there. as well. Uh, again, very good sources of resistance. Just be aware of that. What's the foundation of a good disease management program? Resistance. Okay, there's going to be a test after this. Aerial blight. It's probably the worst aerial blight year I saw or I've seen in a long, long time. Um, you get this blighting, you get this matting together of the leaves. Uh, we have resistance to strobes in this particular population. This, this fungus also infects rice, sheath blight. So if you rotate with rice, if you do beans behind beans, you're going to increase the risk. This pathogen lives in the soil. Anytime you leave a litter in the field, you're going to potentially have problems with this particular disease. I actually saw mycelium growing on the ground from one plant to another. It was beautiful for a plant pathologist. Here's some on the stem. You get this down in here. Usually you'll see those symptoms initiate down here where the patio joins the leaflet because the leaf wetness period is extended during that. That's just extra, extra information. We have strobe resistance. Isn't that beautiful, Tom? See the body down there? I think I'm supposed to say that. Gorgeous. Fungicides, and as we mentioned, reduce till, probably increase the risk due to this problem. All right, so now we have three diseases. Three diseases that have resistance to our strobes. They used to be great. So what, what are you going to do when you see this group 11 and you know you have a resistant population? You're not going to use it. Or there's going to be another number associated, a 7 or something else. Um, resistance is, is a real deal. Soybean rust, we found it in the early 2000s, 2003. It has not really been a big issue. We see it come into the fields very late in the growing season. The fungicides, like our triazoles, are very effective against that. This is just a, a shot looking. And if you, you turn that leaflet over, it's going to start in the bottom canopy. You're going to have sand-like structures. They're going to be raised. You're going to have these pustules sitting right here. It needs living tissue to survive. You say, well, boy, why is that important? Because the organism has to be reintroduced every year. So it has to start it all over again. You don't have a buildup of inoculum. Tillage is not going to have any kind of impact on this particular problem. This was a field in Brazil. It looks pretty good, right? When you walk in there, there's quite a, quite a bit of, I mean, there's some good epidemics initiated. So you can't windshield these fields. And that goes with a lot of these foliar diseases. <coughs> with the exception of Cercosper blight, which is going to start at the top because it's activated by sunlight, these 
disease epidemics are going to initiate down in the bottom of the canopy. So get out there and look and see what's going on. We have fungicides. Even today, to my knowledge, I'm not aware of any really good resistance to this particular problem, although it's not, not something that we have to deal with on a statewide basis. There are late planted beans probably will benefit from an application of a fungicide. Target spot. Um, I'm starting to see a little bit more of that than I, than I saw in previous years. Usually it starts later in the growing season. Usually it doesn't cause any kind of appreciable, uh, have any appreciable impact on yield, but the fact that I'm seeing it more regularly, more frequently, it might initiate into some problem. There does seem to be some bridal resistance based on some ratings that, that uh, Trey and I have made. You'll see a little, and then a little bitty spot here. It's always in the bottom canopy. It's usually in mid to late reproductive growth stages, and then you have this target-shaped lesion. Needs high relative humidity or, or leaf wetness, free moisture, usually evident, as we mentioned, in the reproductive stages. You can see it on other, re on other plant parts other than the leaf, leaflet itself, and it can survive up to two years in the soil. It's like these Cercospor pathogens. The Rhizox is even longer. All right, so when you go out and you identify something, you say, well, you know, I got a problem, I'm, I need to address it. Two different diseases, same symptoms. Fungicides, uh, we got some new ones I'm sure Tom's going to talk about that, that do bring something to the table. Target spot, if you can get the product down in the canopy, uh, we do have some fungicides that look pretty good. So, if you treat with the wrong fungicide, you might be wasting your money. Downy mildew, we see that every year. And uh, OBTs, it can be confused, I guess, a little bit with uh, soybean rust. This looks like dryer lint. You're going to flip that leaflet over. I've had people call me to the field wondering if it was uh, soybean rust. When in fact it wasn't, if you, if you see symptoms on beans in the upper canopy and no defoliation, it's probably not soybean rust. Because by the time it makes it to the upper canopy, you got a problem. So just keep that in mind. And it's, it's not yield limiting, probably not in Mississippi either, huh? Back to your pustule, I'll just bring this to your attention. It, it does look a lot like soybean rust. When you flip the leaf over though, it's, it's darker brown. You do not get that sandy look. I'd, I'd encourage you to invest in a good hand lens. Bosch and Loam, some reputable manufacturer. The cheap ones are not very good. You get these, these will be dusty in appearance. Definitely you'll be wasting your money if you spray for this particular problem. You're going to use crop rotation, clean seed, you're going to avoid susceptible cultivars, and you're not going to cultivate when it's wet because you're going to spread it throughout the field even more. We have our pod and stem blight, anthracnose. Um, it varies from year to year. This looks like when you give a, a three-year-old a piece of charcoal, and he'll just, or she, uh, <laughs> <I'm trying. coughs> he'll just smudge. These are the, the reproductive structures. They'll be in rows if it's pod and stem blight. Uh, fungicides appear to seem, seem to be effective still. We don't really have big, big issues unless we can't get in the field. That's just, I'm doing pretty good. Uh, I get a star, right? All right. Any questions about foliar diseases? I know y'all want to get out of here. Boy, is the aerial blight resistant? Is that everywhere? Is it just in the east spots? It's usually in, right now it's in central Louisiana down, down, down into the southwest part of the state. We found it in Evangeline Parish. I confirmed it last year or I sent a sample off and in Avoles, so it's making its way. Yeah, but northeast Louisiana, we don't see, and I don't know why it jumped. Northeast Louisiana, and then y'all have issues in, in Arkansas with it. I, Not with I, resistance, we don't. Well, I mean that, but Jeremy, you see it too, don't you, in, in Arkansas? Yeah, so? Area of what? Yeah. Yeah, yeah but, but we can still control it with, with strokes. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
We so see we, it up next to poly pipe, stuff like that. We didn't see that much of it last year. I mean, a couple of years ago when we were wet early, we saw quite a bit of our weather conditions last fall. Were not not dry usually. Yeah. Yeah, if it gets hot and dry, it'll shut it down. Where's your mouse across for blank? Symptoms, we all know when the symptoms show up. But when do you think infection takes place? When, when you see the, the when it, it turns it, into it, a blight, the it, entire it, top of the field. It, it, it can occur at seedling and remain latent. But then you split. So Charcoal once rot, you see symptoms, it's long too late to do much about it. More than likely, but I mean, we have some fungicides that are effective when you well, might. No, but you can't, but you can't. I mean, you can't wait till you see symptoms. Top of no, the plant, most plant diseases you have to go with history and make a prophylactic application. So by the time you see symptoms, sure. there's infections you, you haven't even seen already that are occurring. This is a red crown rot. It's it's not widespread problem. I think y'all have a little bit in Arkansas, a little bit in Mississippi. Uh, you get this deteriorated root system. You get these fruiting structures. It's going to be uh, associated with when you plant during kind of moderate wet soils. You see <laughs> symptoms really late in the growing season. It usually infects early. It's triggered, and you get the the foliar and the symptoms at the, on the stem. It overwinters in the soil, so it's going to be more of an issue with no till or reduced till. You get this intervenal chlorosis and necrosis. Improve your drainage, delay your planting, and rotate with a non-host. The only thing in most of the hosts that we, most of the other crops you can rotate with. But you need to do it for two or three years. Sudden death, we've been seeing that in the northeast part of the state. You get this uh, kind of discolored pith. Again, you get these intervagal chlorosis and necrosis. It's favored by cool, wet weather early in the growing season. Survives for the soil in the soil for years, like most of these soil-borne organisms. Now, I'll stop right there and I'll tell you: if you got a problem in a field that's soil-borne, wash your equipment off before you go into another field. I know you're not going to do it. But I'm just telling you. I'm just telling you. <laughs> I wouldn't do it. But I'm telling you, if you introduce nematodes or any of these other diseases, you're not going to get rid of it, and the populations are going to build. Yeah. Uh, up in the Midwest, they looked at different tillage systems, conventional all the way to no-till. They didn't see much difference. there. And Mueller did that. Use resistant varieties. There's a new seed treatment that so shows some promise now. Don't rotate with corn. Cotton would be a much better problem. And plant later if need be. This is taproot decline. You get this. Yeah, it's caused by xylaria. It's a fungus. It can infect young and old plants. Again, you get that intervenal. If you can get the roots out of the ground, you'll have this black substance and the actual fungus may be growing in the pith. There is a, Trey did some work, it looks like there's a slight increase in incidence and severity where you have no till relative to the conventional <coughs> till. And there's some bridal resistance. Now, uh, our master student, Myra just graduated and she screened these varieties in the, in the greenhouse and it looks like we might have some some genetic resistance to work with. Do you all so, have that posted anywhere? I don't, not <coughs> yet, I don't think so. No, I think that's on LSU crops. In my, okay. I think so. I think I, that's on We can there. check with Trey. If I'm not mistaken. Okay. So it's intervenal necrosis, chlorosis, all of this can cause that. So just keep that in mind. Root knot nematode, mm -hmm. uh, pretty bad problem. I've washed my equipment off before I go into another field, for sure. We do have resistant varieties, although I went to several fields in, in mid central Louisiana and then uh, I saw some issues. Didn't seem like a very, probably just real high populations. And charcoal rot. Hot, dry weather, wet soils can also be a problem. Reduced tillage, resistant varieties, we don't really know, moderate at best. There's not been very good, very much research on that. That's all I had. 
Mom about to cut in the top.